My name's Lee Lavis. Uh, I live here and I'm very much part of the kind of process that we're involved in at this moment. Um, I wanted this to happen because I believe that through visits like this we can contribute to understanding but also find peace within ourselves as well. I also want to say thank you to you all for agreeing to come on to it. It's a very, very brave step. And also the partners that we've worked with have taken a very progressive and brave step in themselves to host us. My name's Kieran. Um, I'm a, a local lad. Um, I was uh, I was stationed in this barracks here in the 91, the last 18 months. I did here, I got out of the army in 93. Hey, I'm Les Gibbons. Um, I'm an ex-war marine. I came here when I was 18, um, which is... Uh, and we, I went. We were in. I was in Cross McGlen in 1975-76, four-month tour. Um, it was a, it was a seminal point in my life, um, and I've wanted to come back since. Uh, I've spiked. I've done a tour here in 1981, uh, Belfast. I mean, the hunger strike kicked off, so it was pretty much saturated with British soldiers. A lot of riots, uh, a lot of blast bombs. A few of the guys cut to bit with blast bombs. And it's just the general hatred that I, I couldn't couldn't come to terms with. Grannies, kids, even dogs hated you. You know what I mean? It was, uh, you know, and uh, I carried that hatred for many, many years. But like Gus, you know, you've got to move on. I'm Kenny. Um, I'm from Darlington. I'm originally from the Isle of Man. So I'm a Manxman. Um, Lee knows what I've done. Um, a lot of time here. A lot of incidents involved in. Seen a lot of grief. Been blown up many times. Name's Gus Isles. Did three tours of the province in the 70s, mid 70s onwards, uh, mainly in the Crossman Glen Fourkill area. Um, so, got a few issues on, on one particular killing I remember. However, it's in the past, so the idea is not to dwell too much in the past. For me, it's about moving forward. Hope. It takes effort to build peace, you have to work at it. Here I am, trying to add something. So this is a People's Museum, by the way. So all the artefacts and all the stories that you read on here have all been donated by the people. We're not affiliated to any organisation whatsoever, be it political or otherwise. If it was, I would not be here talking to you. Because I see my brother's death as a human rights issue. Simple as that. Your own brother, Michael, murdered on Bloody Sunday. He was only 17 years old when he died. And he was the youngest to die that day. Now, the last time I seen Michael alive was just before the march, and I explained to him to be careful. If anything happened, they go home, simply because he was never in the march before. And the only reason why he went on the march is because his friends were going. So, after talking to him, he went his way, and I went my way. And the next time I seen him, he was being carried from the house at the other side of the building, on a stretcher. And I helped to place him in the ambulance and take him to the hospital, where he was declared dead on arrival. Within a 150 square metre radius, of where we're standing. Most of the people would have been either shot or murdered on the day of Bloody Sunday. The four soldiers, E, F, G and H, uh, th this is the square that these soldiers actually came into. Just down the bottom right corner here, you can see the blue wall. That's where the four soldiers came in and started to fire into the crowd. Now they started to fire onto people fleeing the sound of gunfire. Most of the people were either shot in the back, some were shot in position of surrender. Other people were executed while they were lying seriously injured on the ground. And yeah. Eugene C coming from a, from a unionist community, so we don't know that. Yeah. yeah. That's not widely known. No, no. And our politicians are still, even though the British government, the British Prime Minister, has admitted that the British army were wrong on that day and that it was murderous actions, the unionist politicians, politicians. in this country will not accept. That's the ruins from Bloody Summer. There. That was an open alleyway. That also was an open alleyway where the red container is as well. So small open alleyways, and this is where the vast majority of people was trying to run in these directions. Where these red brick houses are now, that's where the old Rossville flats were. Are they the blocks of flats that the paratroopers claimed that they were shot from? Yes, that's, that's, yeah, where, that's, they that's where they right. were. Yeah. There would have been a huge barricade 
uh, would have run from that block of flats right across to the, the high rise flats itself. And within that area, that's six of the people was murdered. Mm -hmm. That's a young brother being carried away. And, um, that's him being carried. But this is Jim, he's lying here. There's no way, but it's in right corners. Mm -hmm. and above the fence, you see a part of his helmet there. That's, I believe that's G. And G walked past him. And as you walk past him, Jim moves slightly. He's just stepped away. Boom. Then he went through the alleyway and he shot dead Jerry McKinney and Jared Donaghy from about 10 yards. That's Willie McKinney and Joe Mahon beside each other. See you? That's two more bodies. One of the things you'll see around the far side is the bloodstained banner. It carries the blood of Barney McWigan. Barney stepped out from cover to go to the Paddy Dory, <coughs> who had just been shot by F. And he would stood out, stepped out waving a white handkerchief, and this has all been proven. And the F shot him behind the left ear, and the bullet came out through his eye. He already shot Paddy, he already shot Wally McKinney, and he already shot my brother Michael. It's shocking all, all paratroopers in the yeah. world are used that way. Yeah. It's like maximum use of force, minimum amount of time. So if you've got any, you know, planning from a military point of view, you don't put those type of tro troops into peacekeeping duties. You just don't. Why would you want to bring that calibre soldier to take control of an unarmed peaceful yeah. march? Mm. He's quite a high percentage of guys who served in Iraq. He's got post traumatic stress yeah. with him, I think. Yeah, but what about all those families that we, you know, like, not only the people that are killed, but the, like the, the kids who saw their dads being yeah. dragged out and yes. things like that, you know, mm -hmm. it's much bigger. It's oh, how people's lives are affected, you know. And this is, this is what pushed me forward to as well in relation to this, is the fact how it affected my mother and my family. John once told a story of his, of his mother on a cold evening mm -hmm. stopped walking up to the cemetery with a blanket because Michael would be cold. Yeah, to put over his grave. Yeah. Now that's the sort of thing she did, you know. For five years she remembers absolutely nothing. I'm the brother of, uh, of William McKinney, the day bloody Sunday. And uh, I've been a long campaigner to get the truth of what happened on bloody Sunday. I pulled up uh, punches here, I hit it. Okay. Soldiers when they were here, and uh, and and there you see people. Uh, and but I think he he uh, he had to raise above that. You have to get to our side and and, and see that that the young people to you. There are people out there you'll never change their minds. But it's great, you know, that you guys have come along here. I'm prepared to listen to us, and we're prepared to meet you and, and talk on that even even keel, as if you want to call it that. Hopefully someday we'll see thousands upon thousands of you, you know, uh, uh, coming down with the same viewpoint. Like, mm -hmm. war is futile. End of story. And what happened here at the same time was futile, and it created, created a lot of hurt and pain here. And people are still living with the pain, as you yeah. probably realise, you know. When Eugene was talking earlier, I, 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 just, I, I just wanted to cry. Yeah. Because I didn't know any of this. I knew, all this means to me is I heard Bloody Sunday on the news. Now I'm feeling the people's pain, and that hurts. When we demanded equality or democracy in 1968 during the Civil Rights Movement, it was beat off the streets by the State Police. 12th of August 1969, annual commemoration of the Apprentice Boys of, of Derry. You know, hundreds of loyalists tried to force their way into the bogside, backed up by both the B-Specials and the RUC at that time. During that three-day confrontation, just alone in this area, the bogside, it is estimated that up to 500 cans of gas a day was fired into the bogside. Paddy Coyle, 13 years old, was one of a group of 30 or 40 individuals who actually stayed on top of the Rossville Flats during the actual Battle of the Bogside. They were given a continuous supply of Molotov cocktails, petrol bombs, bricks, rocks, whatever they could use as weapons to stop the RUC and the Loyalists from entering onto the Bogside. It was the Nationalist community, it wasn't the IRA, it was the Nationalist community stood up and defended this area. When we stood up to the state police, they sent on the British Army. See, when they did walk onto the Nationalist Bogside, they were welcomed with open arms. 
they were getting dinners made to them, they were getting tea handed to them. There was still that wide belief that with the amount of soldiers on the streets, this would prevent the attacks within the Catholic community. But it didn't. It just seemed to intensify. Bloody Sunday would have been the day that was looked upon that the civil rights movement ended. But it was also looked upon the year that the IRA intensified their military campaign against the presence and policy of Britain within the North of Ireland. How many of us here um, joined up as junior, you know, under, under 18? I, I did. I was 20. Yeah, I was 16. 16. 16. In fact, whenever I signed the papers, I was 15 and a half. My yeah. father had to sign it. I remember going through school and they said, Violence never solves anything. But if I stepped out of line, they came me. <laughs> and then violence never solves anything. And then I got to the last year of school and they brought the army recruiting team in. And I, like, there's a, there's a mixed morality in all this, isn't there? There's, on one level, they're telling me, no, no, violence is not the answer. But why don't you join the army? Within our community, there was a constant fear of brutality, intimidation by the army, because there was still a wild scale belief that the army were still very much capable of carrying out another bloody Sunday at any time they wanted and still get away with it. It was like the army had a green light to come in and do whatever they wanted and get away with it. Myself and my sister were sitting in the kitchen. I got up and looked out the window and there was soldiers with, you know, the kind of riot gear and visors in the backyard. And the next thing was a knock at the door. And I wasn't allowed to go back to school because our house was being raided for whatever reason, and it was only actually me and my wee, wee sister was living there at the time. Mm -hmm. The sister that I was sitting in the kitchen with was um, my older sister who had come visiting. And she wasn't allowed to leave the house either, so the place was absolutely turned upside down. How old were you? How old was I then? I would have been probably 15, well about 16 probably. And was there any adults there for um, My mother was in, um, but the thing was, there had been, we had always been raided and that was just like, you know, it could have been a, a weekly thing or, you know, two weekly thing and it would have been at the most ungodly hours of the, of the morning and there was mostly only girls in our house. But then for this to happen during the day, it was, it was really... Scary. It was, it, it really freaked me out. And then when I eventually went back to school, I had to go in then and tell the headmaster why I was late back from lunch and, and it was actually when I was sitting trying to explain to him that the reality hit me of what happened. So I started crying and I was like, I don't know why we're getting raided, I don't know why this happens. The intelligence that I was getting back with regarding house raids, etc., there was no intelligence. It was just simply, oh, you're a player, you're a player. Mm -hmm. Right, who should we have today then? Oh, we'll go up and get, you know, Robert's at four o'clock in the morning, just out you get. That was the time. And what the hell were we doing? Do you know what I mean? What are you looking for? Do you know what I mean? You, you weren't getting anything. The, the 500 pound bomb on Bunkrana, that left a, 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 a deep scar on me actually. Having seen the, the, the children coming down the road in the other car, and when it actually went off, the blast actually hit them. Mm -hmm. So they were caught in the middle of it. Uh, that was never published or anything. Sky News and that didn't report these, these people. And I remember to this day running over to that vehicle and dragging the kids and that mother out screaming you know, and dragging down the road just to get them safe you know and um, afterwards you, you sit down and, uh, and people are like distraught but I wasn't I mean I had my breakdown about a year after I'd actually been here and you know thank god I was in I was in my house with my mum you know um, but I just blacked out there's too much stress over the years I mean I even got machine gunned on Craigwagon Bridge. I mean, I've been through a lot of shit over here, you know what I mean? Seriously. When you left, whatever was done for you? Nothing. Nothing. I'll tell you what happened last year. For all those who don't know, I'd had enough. And, um, <laughs> what I did... I went up the centre tap because I know what it's all about and the symbolism, etc. about the centre tap. What I did was I walked in front of hundreds of people that I've seen over the years, every single year for about 10, 11 years. It's grown and it's grown and it's grown bigger and bigger and bigger. I had enough. And I marched straight out in front of the centre tap for my medals. 
just after the last post, I threw them at the centre half and I said, here, take your medals. And I shouted at them, enough. Stop glorifying war and, you know, stop being lied to by these people. And not one of them, not one of them said anything to me, not one. Iraq, Afghanistan, where's it end? You know, you want Syria, you want Iran next, you know. You want to burn the Middle East, you've had Ireland, you've you know, on and on and on. More lies, more lies. It all comes out in the end, and it is, it's all coming out. In 1992, the families got together and we set up a campaign. And it took us six years before the British government reopened the case. If the Tories had been still in power at the time, we would never have had a second inquiry. It lasted 12 and a half years. During the inquiry, we actually seen all the soldiers. We fired off shots at them, every one of them. And absolutely no remorse. And showed pure contempt for us. See where Effa was concerned. Two days of given evidence, nearly 500 occasions, he said he didn't recall and didn't remember. He remembers coming here, remembers going away, but he didn't remember what happened in between. We had to go to London to hear the soldier's evidence, and uh, uh, Soldier F, uh, Kelton Ibrahim, and I always mind uh, the second question he was asked by our barrister was, uh, do, you think, uh, uh, do you think that you've done anything wrong on Bloody Sunday? I'll never ever forget his answer. His answer was, I carried out all my orders according to, to my capability. So he was never told right through this last 40 years that he'd done no, anything wrong. Military ethos can be sort of melted down to three components. One of them is um, following orders without question. Uh, the other is the removal of the barrier to kill. Another component of what we've seen, how, how could people do this to you? And that's because uh, there's a creation of a sense of superiority. And how that's done is, especially in infantry units, is uh, for a start, you're taught to hate other infantry units. So, and then it goes, the best. But it goes the further. So, so you're taught to hate other infantry units, then you're taught to hate other parts of the military, the mm. Navy, their all tossers, the RAF, their scum. And then you're also taught to hate civilians. We, in, in my mm. unit, we used to. We used to, so these are the people we were supposed to be protecting, right? Oh. And we used to call them silly guns. And it was because they were beneath us. These, and these are British civilians we're talking about. Now, if you take those three things, that obeying orders without question, mm. um, the removal of the barrier to kill, and also the dehumanisation of your own people back home, mm -hmm. imagine where that puts people who are from outside of that. When you get out of the army, you carry that with you. When I work, I mean, I've had about 50 jobs since I left the army, because anybody spoke to me the wrong way. I said, who the fuck are you? Yeah. You've not got chevrons in your arm. Piss off, you're inferior to me. Mm. And you have this arrogance about you. And then nobody listens to your war stories, and you start to feel isolated and lonely, and that's when the lunacy starts. Mm -hmm. And you start to think, well, fucking listen to me, you know? And start Always smashing mean. up the house and drinking yourself uh, stupid. This, this, is, seems this be, is what happens It seems to, to be that, that, that uh, it's, it's all the... They condition the mind. They see our people as not human. Yeah. Hmm. The conclusions of this report are absolutely clear. There is no doubt. There is nothing equivocal. There are no ambiguities. What happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. It was wrong. The report was handed over to the Public Prosecuting Services. They made a decision and told the PSNI, advised them to set up a murder investigation. The announcement was nearly two years ago. And we were told at the time that it would be protected. The money was ring-fenced. We had 12 detectives from England, Scotland, Wales walking around, knocking on doors and getting the trust of the people. But they have been sent home last Thursday. They're no longer here. They're using the excuse, no money. Now they talk about dealing with the past, the politicians, and I think this is their answer. They put it to bed. So I think that's the way out, and I reckon it's a political decision. I was eight years old when bloody Sunday happened. Liar. And uh, <laughs> I'm fuffy this year. And, uh, but 
We have, have went the, uh, the Sinn Féin, we went to the SDLP, all the political parties, any political party that was willing to help us, we talked to them, even unions. Especially this last uh, 10 years, everybody talks about a peace process. It's happening here. But the victims that are, are there for this no peace process are still the same. Mm -hmm. And especially ourselves, we haven't got any real justice yet. We're going to be denied that by the looks of things. Yeah. Uh, but not just, the, not just us, the Bloody Sunday families, but hundreds of other, mm -hmm. you know, the Cunis family, mm -hmm. Valley Murphy, where Paris were involved in that too as well, and numerous mm -hmm. others, right across the board, they're all going to be denied justice. And there are people going to go to the graves and have gone to their graves and never ever seen justice achieved. And, and the difficulty we ours, ours happened nearly 43 years ago. I was talking to the policeman there a couple of weeks ago and he told me nearly 200 witnesses have now passed away. Oh, all, all, the, all the parents of all the, the young guys who died on Bloody Sunday, they're all gone. Mm. We have had half the injured have now passed away. And last couple, about two months ago, we had one of the widows passed mm. away. So as time goes on, I, that's what we believe is happening here too as well. The time is the main factor mm. in dealing with the problem. Apart from what I was talking about earlier on about money, the longer it takes, more people are going to pass away. There's nobody going to be left to actually to deal with it. And this is what's exactly happening now at the present time. What would be your, your ideal outcome for justice? And would that make you feel better? Would that, I mean, that's obviously not going to put to bed the way you felt, the way you feel now. But if, if someone could come in here now and hand you a golden ticket and say, what, there's your justice, own, what is it? The golden ticket would be the British government to be, to be accused of war crimes. Yes. That's my, well, that's 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 my golden important. ticket. Mm -hmm. But what I'm, I, I'm trying to say is, well, I know that's never going to happen. The politicians have moved on and the peace process has moved on. But I think in a way that we've been left behind.